Our grandchildren are going to want to know the story of this time, this pivotal decade, when we either found our way forward or we did not. Was it like this, they'll say? Was it like storm clouds building on the horizon and desperate people pushing across the borders? Was it about shouting and gunfire? Or was it quiet, simple disappearances, lost opportunities, lost species, quiet as snow melting, quiet as water evaporating, quiet as desiccation? Was it exciting? Were people full of new ideas and new energy with this new sense of empowerment, this weepy joy of relief that you finally did it, this weepy joy of redemption? Our children and our grandchildren are, want to know, are want to, going to want to know if we saw it coming. They're going to want to know how hard did we try. They're going to ask for an accounting. They'll want a book of the prayers that people prayed during the Hinge Decade. They'll want jars filled with the last of things. They'll want to hear this jaw-dropping story of this moment in this place. Well, the point is that, that we're the ones who are going to write this story. We're writing the story by our actions, and we might think about what kind of a story will it be. You know, this pivotal years of global warming, it could be a crime novel. It is a crime novel. <laughs> it could be a horror story, couldn't it, with zombie cockroaches. It could be scripture with all its terror and grace. It could be, it, it, it's going to be a thriller with a thousand plot turns. It could be, and I'm afraid it might be, an absurdist nihilist farce. What are you waiting for, Vladimir? Nothing. It could be a Greek tragedy where the heroes are brought down by their own hubris. Or it could be an adolescent comic book, the sort of story of domination that stirs the loins of teenage boys and Wall Street bankers. <laughs> the point I want to make is that none of these stories is good enough. None of these stories is good. Anybody a Wall Street banker? <laughs> none of these stories is good enough. And we're going to have to come up with a better story than this. And as I think about the stories, the only story that I know ha has this power to change planetary history is going to be a love story. And when I say that, I know half of you go, ah, and the other half go, uh. <laughs> Once I spoke to the Industrial Loggers Association, and after I spoke, there was this big burly guy that comes, he says, I agree with everything you say, and I thought it was a good talk, but, but next time, don't use that L word. And I didn't know what he meant. I thought he meant liberal. But no, it was love. He says, you've got to do this without talking about love because that's too soft. Well, that's not the kind of love I'm talking about. And because I, as a writer, talk about emotions, I want to read you about three paragraphs from this Moral Ground book that we'll talk about a little bit later, where I try to express what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the kind of love that we're going to have to invoke, the kind of ferocious love that we're going to have to live by in order to get it through this pivotal time. So maybe four paragraphs, OK? In the spring, oh dear. In the spring when our granddaughter was born, I brought her to the pond so she could feel the comfort I had known there for so many years. Killdeer waddled in the mud by the shore, but even then, not so many as before. Ahead of the coming heat, butterflies fed in the mud between the cracks, unrolling their tongues to touch salty soil. I held my granddaughter in my arms and sang to her then, an old lullaby that made her soften like wax in a flame, molding her little body to my bones. I held her close, weighing the chances of the birds and the butterflies. She fell asleep in my arms, unafraid. I will tell you, I was so afraid. Poets warned us, writing of the heartbreaking beauty that will remain when there is no heart to break for it. But what if it's worse than that? What if it's the heartbroken children who remain in a world without beauty? 
How will they find solace in a world without wild music? How will they thrive without green hills edged with oaks? How will they forgive us for letting frog song slip away? When our granddaughter looks back at me, I will be on my knees, begging her to say I did all I could. I didn't do all I could have done. It isn't enough to love a child and wish her well. It isn't enough to open my heart to a bird-graced morning. Can I claim to love a morning if I don't protect what creates its beauty? Can I claim to love a child if I don't use all the power of my beating heart to preserve a world that nourishes children's joy? Loving is not a kind of la-di-da. Loving is a sacred trust. To love is to affirm the absolute worth of what you love and to pledge your life to its thriving, to protect it fiercely and faithfully for all time. That's the kind of love that this crisis and this pivot point calls us to. It's that kind of ferocious love. And it calls us to this question, all of us confronting this question. What do I love too much to lose? And how, in what particular way, am I going to stand my ground to protect it? That's what we are called to do. That kind of honesty and that kind of determination. So with that introduction, let's get into the meat of this. And I, I want uh, tonight to try to address three questions. Um, the first one, why, why, why do this work? Why me? Why any of us? Why do we have to do this work to keep the extractive growth economy from wrecking the world? It's the first. Question number two, what is standing in our way? Why is this so hard? And number three, what are we gonna do about that? Okay, so question number one, why bother? Why are you even here tonight? Actually, it's very beautiful. And, and we'll all be dead before the truly horrific effects of climate change kick in, I trust. What does it matter that decades from now, salmon are still returning to the streams? That decades from now, healthy children are still humming themselves to sleep and sandhill cranes are burbling in the meadows? Well, the answer I would give to that is that it's an issue of moral obligation. That it's clear to me that although climate change is an economic issue, it's certainly a national security issue, it's a scientific and technological issue, but it's fundamentally a moral issue, and it calls for a moral response. It's not just astonishingly stupid or expensive to wreck the world, it's wrong. And so here's my kind of statement of principle, that if we are to take what we need whatever we need for our profligate lives, and leave a ransacked and dangerous world for our grandchildren, that's selfish beyond imagining. And to let it slip away the millions of years it takes to evolve the song in a frog's throat, or the stripes in a lily's, to let it slip away while we're distracted, while we're getting the kids to soccer, while we're noticing how busy we are, that is unforgivable. And when the big oil executives, to increase profits that are already unimaginable profits, when to increase their profits, they knowingly take down the great systems that sustain human life and all the other lives on Earth, when they sit in boardrooms and design business plans that require that they would damage or destroy the lifeways of these beings, they target the beings who have no voices to defend themselves, these innocents, future generations, plants and animals, children, marginalized peoples on the boundaries of the economy and on the boundaries of the continents. When they devise those business plans, what are we to say about that? I would call that moral savagery on a cosmic scale. That's what I want to call attention to. It's not just sad. There are terrible wrongs being done to this planet and we need to stand up against them. Now, a, a parenthetical, if I could, just stop just a minute, because oftentimes when I start talking like that, 
people come up afterwards and say, you know, um, I don't know, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't know if you can actually say those things, they're not very nice. Environmentalists are nice. You're not nice. Um, it's polarizing, it's shaming, it's a bad thing. And my answer to that is yes, maybe so, but I am reclaiming my right to outrage. I listen to my Buddhist friends and they advise compassion. And I say, yes, compassion, but the Dalai Lama writing about climate change says, the destruction of nature and natural resources results from ignorance, greed, and lack of respect for the Earth's living things. Ignorance, check. Greed, check. Lack of respect for the Earth's living things, check. So outrage is a measure of what a person cares about the most, what you love, what ideals you affirm, what breaks your heart or dashes your hopes. And so when we feel called to outrage, when we feel outrage, it's a call to truth telling. It's a naming of the wrong for what it is. What is going on here? It's a kind of respect too, to say that these people who, people who are destroying the earth are not morons or idiots or, or, or helpless in the face of a system. They are rational human beings making reasoned decisions. And outrage is a kind of response that bears witness to the suffering of innocent beings. And I would posit that outrage is an expression of love. It is only one step removed from an overpowering grief. So, end of the parentheses, close parentheses. I'm just asserting my right to, to speak my heart. But I am a philosopher, so I have to actually use my mind. And philosophers are committed to reasoning. That is to say, I'm allowed to draw a conclusion but I have to give reasons in support of what I say. And what is called for is not pontification or, or, or claiming things. It's what's called for is reasoning, moral reasoning, uh, which is giving reasons to affirm your deepest belief and then to provide reasons that um, check them against your actions. So, so the point that I would make is that scientists have reached this overwhelming consensus about the facts of climate change, but we have yet to do the work of achieving an overwhelming consensus about the morality of climate change. And that that is a job left undone that is preventing us from making forward, forward progress. So I think about this in terms of Aristotle. That's what happens when you invite a philosopher. We're gonna talk about syllogisms, okay, for just a minute. Any argument that has as its conclusion a statement about what we ought to do is going to have to have two premises. The first premise is a factual premise based on science, based on empirical evidence. This is the way the world is. This is the way the world will be if we continue in this vein. But you can't draw a conclusion about what ought to be from what is unless you have a second premise and the second premise is normative. It has to do with values. It's a judgment about what's just, what's good, what's beautiful, what is better and worse. So if you know the way the world is and will be, and if you know what you most deeply believe about the way the world ought to be, then you can draw a conclusion about what you ought to do. But if the second premise is missing, no, not all the scientists in the world can help us decide what to do. So what we need is this national discourse, this work of the second premise. What do we dream? What do we cherish? What do we seek? If we don't know that, we don't know where to aim. Environmental activism so often tells us what we're against. Environmental activism has to also tell us what we're for, this new vision. Now, at this point, you know, it's, it's a common response for the people to say, you aren't, you know, <laughs> those philosophers, they don't understand what actually makes the world go round. And what makes the world go round is money, in particular the dollar, the US dollar. Nobody ever changed their mind on the basis of a moral belief. All this talk about ethics is just a waste of time. That, my friends, is a misreading of history. And if you look at Western history, I'm not a scholar I, I, of, of other histories, but I know enough to say this, that every time I see a society 
changing on a dime, making a radical, convulsive change, it's been because of a rising wave of moral affirmation of great principles. So we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, a magnificent statement of moral principle, and the European monarchies fell like dominoes. Or all persons held as slaves within any state shall be then thenceforward and forever free. And the direction of history reversed its flow against all the economic factors. Or I have a dream that this nation will rise up. And the troopers and the growling dogs backed away. Hell no, I won't go in a war ended. You see my point? That if we're looking for the cause of change in history, we see again and again that it's this rising wave among the people of saying that is wrong and it cannot be tolerated. This is right and we must bring it to, into our lives. So a new declaration of independence. All beings have a right to a healthy and life-sustaining planet. And this right overrides the presumed right of the few to plunder the common heritage and destabilize the Earth's future without restraint. Can we get behind that? <laughs> My colleague and I, in a trying to um, jumpstart this national conversation about this, this moral discourse, uh, wrote a note to a hundred of the world's moral leaders. People like Desmond Tutu and Wangari Mathai, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, a whole lots and lots of people, writers included, uh, and we asked them this question. Actually respond in only 2,000 words, civil play. <laughs> Do we have a moral obligation to the future to leave a world as rich in possibilities as our own? And we got back these extraordinary responses. Yes, they said, for all these reasons. And I want to, we put these reasons into categories and I want to tell you all of them and ask you to listen for the ones that speak most strongly to you. Do we have an obligation to the future? Why do we have to act now for the sake of the future? For the survival of humankind, for the sake of the children, for the sake of the earth, for the sake of all forms of life on the planet, to protect human rights, to honor our duties of gratitude, for the full expression of human virtue, because all flourishing is mutual, for the stewardship of divine creation. Why? Because compassion requires it. Why? Because justice demands it. And because the earth is beautiful, and because we love the world, because we honor earth and earth systems, and because our moral integrity requires us to do what is right. This is extraordinary outpouring, and the whole point is that, that I'm hoping that somewhere in there is a reason that appeals to everyone, no matter what their value systems or worldviews are. Um, but for today, I've just picked out um, three that I thought maybe would speak most powerfully to you. Or maybe I just picked out three because they spoke most powerfully to me, and I think we are cousins. Um, the first one is this notion that climate change is a failure of reverence, that, that we have an obligation to the future because we have an obligation to act reverently toward the earth. So I think just wonder, you know, sitting on this island, just wonder at this extraordinary chance that we find ourselves in the era where evolution has achieved its greatest fullness of flowering. The theologian Thomas Berry called it, we are living in the most lyric period of earth history. Imagine our good fortune. Imagine our responsibility. Imagine our good fortune to live in a time of thrush song and 30,000 species of orchids, a time of microscopic sea angels with tiny wings and whales that teach each other to sing. Imagine our good fortune to live in the time of crocodiles and butterflies with curled tongues and a bat that's no bigger than a bee. But Thomas Berry goes on to say, it's our generation that is witnessing the end of the era that we evolved in. My generation has done what no previous generation could do because they lack the technological power and what no future generation will be able to do 
because the planet will never again be so beautiful or abundant. We've seen extinction before on this planet. Actually, we've probably all of you seen the movie of the end of the Jurassic period when the asteroid took out the dinosaurs. 89% of all living things during that extinction. Are we going through an extinction? Are we beginning into an extinction of equal power? Well, in the last 40 years, 39% of terrestrial wildlife gone, not necessarily species, but numbers. 39% of terrestrial wildlife. 39% of marine wildlife, gone. 76% of freshwater wildlife, gone in our lifetimes. And the greatest extinctions are in the poor countries, with losses of up to 58% overall, because the wealthy countries are outsourcing our environmental destruction. What's the cause? That's not hard to know. You could just lift your eyes to the hills and your glance across the valleys or walk into Walmart. Um, deforestation, loss of habitat, overharvesting of the oceans, poisoning of the land. You know, I don't need to go on in climate change. And what causes that? A way of life, a constantly growing, all consuming culture that's driven by extractive industries that have few legal or moral constraints. <coughs> It's madness, the choices we make. There's a desecration. Unless something stops us, we'll keep on converting living creatures into dead commodities. We trade deep mossy forests for uselessly large homes. We trade albatross for plastic six-pack rings. We trade meadows that are miraculous with butterflies for industrial parks to manufacture My Little Pony. We trade a singing marsh for another Kmart parking lot. It's madness, the consumption, the eating up. We trade fence rows and goose slews for yet more golf courses. We trade spotted owls for typing paper. We trade old oaks for turning lanes. What are we thinking? We're not thinking. <laughs> it's this frenzied, mad auction of what is of ancient value for what's cheap and desperately sad. It's a mad rush to the end of the world. Whether you think that the world was created by God, or whether you think that it's the result of the onrushing creative urgency of the universe, either way, this world is irreplaceable and it's essential. It is beautiful and fearsome. It's beyond human understanding. It's astonishing. That's the language of the sacred. Reckless destruction of this world is a desecration. Climate change, I think, is a failure of reverence. So that's the first reason, I think, why we have to act. And I love while well, I'm picking it out. The second reason has to do with our love for our children. According to a letter, a recent letter from 500 scientists led, from, led by a team of uh, Stanford scientists, a consensus statement, Unless we take concrete, immediate action, by the time today's children have grown to middle age, the life support systems of the earth will be irretrievably damaged. When today's children are middle aged, the life support systems of the earth will be irretrievably damaged. Who are those children? I know one of them. Her name is Zoe. She's eight years old. She's my granddaughter. At night, she sleeps with a night light on because she's afraid of the dark, but that's the only thing in the world that she's afraid of. She sings herself to sleep. Laugh, kookaburra, laugh, kookaburra, gay your life must be. By the time Zoe is middle-aged, the life support systems of the planet will be irretrievably damaged. I can't let it happen. They didn't make this mess, and they don't deserve what's coming at them. But unless we stop the fossil fuels, they'll be living in this world as well as they can with the violent, chaotic weather and the failing agricultural systems and the crashing food pyramids in the ocean and water shortages and wars for resources and massive movements of people who are driven from their homes by floods and crop failure. It's a betrayal. You know, my friend Brian Doyle, who's a Portland poet, I, I said, you know, speak to me about this. And he says, why do we have to stop climate change for the sake of the children? Because we swore and vowed to every God we ever imagined or invented or dimly sensed 
that we would care for them with every iota of our energy when they came to us miraculously from the sea of the stars. Because they are the very definition of the innocent, and every single blow and shout and shiver of fear that rains down on them is utterly undeserved and unfair and unwarranted. And because we used to be them, and we remember dimly what it was like to be small and frightened and confused. Number three, violation, climate change is a violation of basic principles of justice and human rights. And I'm gonna start speeding up here so I don't take all the time. But consider, consider the food supply in the oceans. One out of seven people on Earth depend on food from the ocean. If the ocean systems collapse under acidification, what will the people eat? One out of seven. Consider fresh water. The ice on the Tibetan Plateau waters 10 major river systems that provide drinking water for 1.3 billion people, 20% of the world's population. When the glaciers are gone, what will those people drink? Consider agriculture. The most recent report that I read said that by the end of the century, 99% of Africa will be unsuitable for agriculture. What will the people eat then? So with all these overwhelming reasons to act, reasons based on our deepest, most fiercely held values, why is it so hard to get moving? So now we need to get down to brass tacks. I think we're making two mistakes in the way that we think, uh, four mistakes actually. No, actually it turned out to be three. <laughs> we'll get there. I think we're making three mistakes in how we think about climate change and they are big ones. And the first one you hear all the time, um, it's Pogo, people quote Pogo, and they say, uh, we have met the enemy and he is us. And people say, I can't act about climate change because I, like all of us, depend on fossil fuels. And what a hypocrisy it would be for me to be, be, be casting aspersions on big oil when they're, they're only selling it because I'm buying it. So I have no moral authority to speak against climate change. Have you heard that? I most recently heard it from Drew Faust, the president of Harvard University. Bah. <laughs> this may be one of the biggest triumphs of big oil, to make consumers blame themselves for climate change, even while the corporations are spending billions of dollars to transform us and manipulate us into being mindless consumers of self-destructive consumer goods and fossil fuels, and even as they're doing everything they possibly can to make sure we have no choice. So I hear people say we've met the enemy and he is us. I think we should think very, very carefully. Of course, we should spend and invest and work and travel more thoughtfully. We should, all of us, sell any investment we might have in any of these fossil fuels. Of course, we should dramatically cut our use of fossil fuels. That said, the corporations are very happy to claim that they're responding to public demand, but it's very clear when you think about it how much corporations are manipulating public demand. They build and they maintain infrastructures that force consumers to use fossil fuels to get from one place to another. They convince politicians to kill or lethally underfund alternative energy or transportation initiatives. Why don't you have public transportation that's decent on this island? They increase the demand for energy intensive products through advertising. They create confusion about the harmful effects of burning fossil fuels. They influence elections to defang the regulatory agencies that might limit their power to impose their risks on other people. So we've met the enemy and I'm going to make sure that I do everything I can to be sure that it isn't me. But while big oil is externalizing all its costs on me, I'm not going to let it externalize its shame. They can come and talk about the enemy being us after we have alternative ways of moving around, alternative ways of, of acting. Mistake number two, that climate change is about climate change. It isn't, I don't think. I think climate change is part of this larger struggle to reclaim democracy. Uh, have you seen this cartoon? It's a wonderful thing, and it's got this big whiteboard, and uh, it says, what will be gained by stopping climate change? 
energy independence, preserve forests, sustainability in green jobs, livable cities, healthy children, fresh food, environmental justice, renewable fuels, clean air, quiet, clean water. And then there's this grumpy guy in a suit, and he stands up and he says, what if climate change is a big hoax and we create a better, better world for nothing? <laughs> but the thing is, there's something huge missing from that list of what we gain when we gain independence <coughs> from fossil fuels. We could regain our democracy. The huge financial power of the fossil fuel industry has this terrible, terrible distorting effect, as we all know. I could start talking about dollars <coughs> devoted to elections, but I'll just tell you about one. You already know it. The Koch brothers have now pledged $889 million to the next election. That's cheap if it allows the industry to continue to make the kind of profits that they're making. That's nothing. Plato, Plato had it figured out way back in ancient Greece. He didn't like democracy. He said every democracy turns into a plutocracy, the rule by the rich. And because people can always buy votes. And every plutocracy turns into anarchy because the people will not put up with that for long. So the, clearly the United States has moved into the plutocratic stage. Are you with me on that? We don't have to make that argument. The rule by the rich. And the question then that we face is, will we be able to return to a democracy or will it be anarchy? It's an open question. It's that serious. Now, Plato, he, he had this great solution. He thought that he would make the philosophers into the kings, that we would all have philosopher kings. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the world's worst idea. <laughs> Trust me, I've spent my life with philosophers. <laughs> Mistake number four, it's hopeless. There's nothing that can be done. So yeah, okay, let's face it. Our options are limited. Our cities and our transportation systems are disgracefully designed. Destructive ways of living are tangled in tangles of profit and power all around the world. Corporations are behaving like psychopaths and we have run out of time. The most conscientious person is going to have a real hard time making significant change. And then here's Gus Speth, the former dean uh, from Yale, who says, all we have to do to destroy the planet's climate and ecosystem and leave a ruined world for our children and grandchildren is to keep doing exactly what we are doing today. And there is new polling out about you people, about people who are alarmed or concerned about climate change. 85% feel afraid, 81% feel sad, 79% feel angry, disgusted, 76%. Are you in that category? But the worst of all is the 61% of us who feel helpless. And that's really a problem because we've built a society that's built around the future. We are fixated on the future and we judge the value of everything we do by its consequences. Utilitarianism, consequentialism. We've therefore built a society that can be radically disempowered by, by, by hopelessness. Other societies aren't as vulnerable to hopelessness, but ours, judging everything by its consequence, can be obliterated by hopelessness and so can the climate movement. But notice that that's a fallacious argument. Philosophers call it the fallacy of the false dichotomy. So there are, so it works like this. People say there are people who have this blind hope. Everything is going to be fine, regardless of what I do, so I don't have to do anything. And on the other hand, alternatively, we have those who have this blinding despair. No matter what I do, everything is going to hell, so I don't have to do anything. Note the moral abdication on both sides. Even if I have blinding hope or if I have blinding despair, I don't have to do a thing. Let's party. That's a fallacy because in between these two extremes is this very broad area that we call integrity, personal integrity. 
this notion, this essential meal of ground, which is acting not out of hope and not failing to act out of despair, but acting out of integrity, the effort to create a wholeness between what you believe is right and what you do. So a person lives with integrity when there is that match between what they think is right and what they actually manage to, to do. So a person lives gratefully because she believes that life is a gift. The person acts reverently because she believes the world is sacred. A person might live simply because they don't believe in taking more than their fair share. A person would act lovingly towards the earth because she loves it. So the point is that we're not acting in these ways because we think we're gonna save the world. We're acting in these ways because we want to act out of our own convictions. We're acting in these ways because we believe that we have the power to make our lives into works of art that express our deepest values. And that, that is our calling. If you love the world, and if you want to be a person of integrity, then you will have to engage in a fierce and tireless and maybe tragic defense of the world against those who pe people who would, who would wreck it. So what are we gonna do? Where are we gonna start? So um, last June, two Junes ago, I was up on the Tolklat River in Denali National Park up in Alaska. It was the summer solstice, June 22nd. It was midnight. The temperature was 104 degrees. We were in a tar paper shack. <laughs> uh, in order to let the breezes through, we had to open the door, which meant that all the mosquitoes would come in. So my husband, who would always rather be hot than be bitten by mosquitoes, is completely covered with a white sheet. He looks as dismayed as a corpse. I, who would rather be bitten than hot, I'm half dressed, lying there, swatting mosquitoes. The door, which is studded with big spikes to keep the bears out, is, as I had said, open. And my job, being closest to the door, is to listen all night for rustling. <laughs> and if I hear it, I am to leap out of bed and slam shut the door. We had come to the Toklat River to think about climate change. It was not going well. So I'm lying there in bed, and I'm hearing the river, and I'm thinking about this other river, that I'm thinking, I'm in absolute despair. Here we are, all of us, caught up in this terrible braided river of, of corruption and, and ruin, and so much power, so much, so much headwater. There's no way we're gonna dam that river. So I just knew I wasn't gonna sleep, so I got up and I went to the side of the river, and as I was watching this river, of course, you remember, this is midnight, on the solstice, so it's completely light. So I'm watching this river, a root ball disengages from the bank and it rolls down and it lodges against the stone. The current comes down, encounters that root ball, slows, drops some sand, curls around the back of that, curls back upstream. You've seen this, you're people of the river. You know that an obstruction in a current will change the force of the current against itself, right? So I stood there and I started looking at this and everywhere there was any obstruction in that river, the river was changed. And you could see where the river had become so obstructed by rocks or root balls or skeletons, in this case of a doll sheep, that it had jumped from that course into another river course. Well, I start to grin and I'm standing there chucking in stones because I finally figure out we don't have to stop this river. We just have to get enough obstruction in there to change the course of river so that it turns against itself. Every, every ousting of a lying politician is a stone in the river. Every invention of a new way to heat our homes or cook our food is a stone in the river. Every person standing on the rail tracks and saying this train will not pass is a stone in the river. There are, we are standing on riverbanks full of stones. All we have to do is pick them up and chuck them in. And so suddenly I was starting to feel pretty good. <coughs> and I was thinking about Joanna Macy. Joanna Macy, the wonderful Buddhist eco-philosopher who said, there's really three things that we have to do in any kind of effort for social change. The first one is to stop the harm. So some of our rocks are gonna be holding actions to slow the damage to the earth and its beings. We have to stop making it worse. So one sort of stone that we all have right there lying at our feet are actions that would reduce the amount of greenhouse gases, that would help 
leave the ancient carbon in the ground. A, an action that would stop bulldozing of a particular forest. We have to stop paving the meadows for God's sake. We have to stop buying stuff. All of us have ways of slowing the river by stopping one particular kind of harm. So we say, each of us, individually or collectively, what destruction can I stop? What dest destruction can I stop? What oil terminal? What parking lot? What coal train? What poison spraying truck? What clear cut? What pipeline? What corrupt or craven politician can I stop together with my friends? Just choose one, chuck the stone in, choose one, move fast, bring art, bring crowds, bring pressure, bring lawsuits, bring the children's choir. You know, Friedrich Nietzsche, by the way, said, we have art in order not to die of the truth. That there are truths out there that are too big for us, they would kill us. And so we have that truth delivered to us by the artists. That, I think, is a really important point for those who would be climate activists. The truths of climate change are so big, they will kill us. The only way we can receive them, I believe, is through art. So, art actions. Go out to one of your um, clear cuts and put a little white cross on every single stump. Call attention to the destruction. Witness the destruction. Send around a flyer saying, at 2 p.m. on Sunday, assemble here. We'll have the church choir, and we're going to be singing Requiem. Um, if you, if you um, want to point out that the coal trains are destroying the children's future, get the children to draw pictures of the future that they dream for themselves, tape them on the tracks in front of the train, and force the train to roll over the dreams of the children. You see, you see what I'm trying to suggest is that there are ways that art and imagination um, can, can, um, can tell a truth that we can't see otherwise. Um, if you have a poison spraying truck that goes down the side of the road and kills all the wildflowers, you need to rent a hearse and drive everywhere it goes, just kind of tootle along behind it, calling attention to the fact, you see what I'm trying to talk about, performance art, ways in which we can tell the truth. This turns out oftentimes to be street democracy. Um, we need to hold our leaders to account. If they sell out to this culture of destruction, we have to throw them out. And if they stand courageously against it, we have to stand with them. So that's the first thing, find ways to stop the harm, both in terms of what we're doing, we can set good examples, and in terms of what, in terms of what um, other corporations are doing. The second thing Joanna says that we need to do is radically reimagine our life ways and our livelihood that match our vision of a sustainable, thriving world. This is not small changes, this is not recycling. Although I do believe that recycling is a gateway drug to conservation. <laughs> um, this is major change, and I was so happy to see so many of you stand up. These are major changes in how we live. Our problem isn't with renewable energy or farm fish or other desperate ways to save our way of life. We don't need to save our way of life. The problem is our way of life. The culture that prides itself on accumulating wealth instead of sharing it, the culture that gobbles up the fecundity of the planet instead of nurturing it, an economy that eats its own feet and throws its own children off the bridge, an economy of infinite extraction will, will kill off the sources of its sustenance. So our job is not to find ways to save that way of life. The challenge is to save the sustaining world from that way of life. And that requires us to radically change how we value and how we play out our values in, in the decisions we make about our lives. Brian Doyle again, he says, have we gone stale and dim as a species? <coughs> have we gone stale and dim as a species? No, he bellows. Let us send our wild and holy imaginations into the future. Yes. Let us send our wild and holy imaginations into the future. And by the way, I am sick and sick and sick of this ethic that we've developed of regulation where a corporation will say, how much destruction can I profit from before some rule shuts me down? They have like, like corporate ethicists to tell them, how much harm can I do before I have to stop? What we need is an ethic of aspiration, an ethic of affirmation. 
What is a good corporation? Is it possible? What is an honorable harvest? What is a good life? How can I make my life an expression of that? We're awash in good ideas. We just need to live them. Thirdly, Joanna Macy says, we need to be the paradigm shift. Um, you all know what I'm talking about with a paradigm shift. That history goes along, goes along, goes along, and people all have a set of beliefs that they kind of swim in. Answers to the questions, who, what is the world? What is human being? <clears throat> What's the relation of human beings to this world? We all have this, and then suddenly something new happens, some new story emerges, not yet fully formed, and there's a kind of tectonic trembling. It's a time of shouting and bullies when the old way meets the new way, and those who feel themselves threatened are using everything they can to cling to the, new, the old way, knowing that the new way is coming to replace it. Of course, this is a time of violence. Of course, it's a time of corporate response, and then something happens. Maybe it happens in Copernicus's workshop in Poland. Maybe it happens in Selma, Alabama. Maybe it happens at the Berlin Wall. Maybe it happens in the Pacific Northwest, where the things people believe about what is true and right take this big leap forward and leave that old way behind. And so I want to close by, by suggesting that there is a new and a very old and indigenous ecological evolutionary story that is emerging. It is the love story that we have been looking for. This is the story that will make this tectonic shift, that will make this um, paradigm shift towards kinship. It's a story of kinship in a world that's interconnected and interdependent and finite and resilient and beautiful. And like any worldview and like any uh, set of um, beliefs, it provides a measure of what is good and sensible, and it calls into question the absolutely moronic decisions that were made under the old worldview. So here it comes, this new love story. Because we understand that the world's systems are interconnected, we realize that damage to any part of the world is damage to all of us. This is the foundation of justice. Because we understand that the world is interdependent, we acknowledge our reliance on one another and on the life-giving systems of the earth. This is the foundation of compassion. Because we recognize that the earth is finite, we embrace an ethic of restraint and precaution to replace a destructive ethic of, e of excess. This is the foundation of prudence. Because we understand the planet's systems are resilient, we are called to stop the harm and undo the damage we have done. This is the foundation of hope. And because the earth is beautiful, we will refuse to be made into foot soldiers in the oil industry's wars against the earth. This is the beginning of moral courage. And one more sentence. This is the love story that we are called to live. Thank you. <laughs> They've asked me to do a benediction. This is not in my job description as a philosophy professor. But I do, I do have something to close with that I would like to offer you by way of um, thanks and encouragement. It comes from <clears throat> Clarissa Estes. She says, do not lose heart. We were made for these times. Yes, for years we have been learning, practicing, been in training for, and just waiting to meet on this exact plane of engagement. I recognize a seaworthy vessel when I see one. There have never been more able vessels in the water than there are right now across the world. And they are fully provisioned and able to signal one another as never before in the history of humankind. There will always be times when you feel discouraged. I too have felt despair many times in my life, but I do not keep a chair for it. I will not entertain it. 
It is not allowed to eat from my plate. I hope you will write this on your wall. When a great ship is in harbor and moored, it is safe. There can be no doubt. But that is not what great ships are built for. Together, we are a great ship, and we are under sail. Thank you so much. So I think uh, I can safely speak for all of you that were pretty moved and inspired. And I found it interesting when Kathleen, uh, when we were talking about the evening, said the next portion is the most important part. And while it's true we have cookies, and that's pretty nice, <laughs> there's an opportunity to network and to find out what you can do by visiting uh, our information tables. And we hope that you enjoy tea and cookies or carrots, but also find out who you might network 